I do appreciate Jimmy being kind enough to call me Mr. Duval. He is over 30 years old, um, so I don't know. <laughs> well, speaking of, of Mr. Duval and, and um, special people and all that, <clears throat> this evening we're going to talk about special people. And uh, young people, if you're sitting at home and, and your parents have come up to you and have told you how special you are, we're not talking about that. <laughs> We're not talking about that type of special. The passage that was read for us earlier, we'll come back to it later in the lesson. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, the King James Version uses the phrase that we are a peculiar people. And the New King James Version uses it, we are God's own special people, or God's own possession. Tonight we're going to take a look at special people. Special people. Now, in order to do that, we have to go back in time. We have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses there. God picks Abraham out of all the people in the world. Now, you know, there's no telling how many people. If you look, on the, look at the genealogical time frame established by Genesis 5 and then Genesis 10... If I remember correctly, I think um, Abraham may have overlapped one of the sons of Noah, possibly, or maybe only been separated by about two or three hundred years. I'm not real certain. You might look at my notes on that. But the point is, is that there had been a good number of years since the flood in order for the world to repopulate. So there might be a million people on the earth, might be two millions. Who, who knows at this time? But of all the people on the earth, God chose Abraham. And to Abraham, he says, beginning there in verse 1, he says, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now notice there, he says, I will make you a great nation. I will make your name great. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God picked Abraham and said, you are my people. And I will bless you. And I will make your people multiply. But then when we, come, we jump forward to Genesis chapter 26, we see God essentially saying the same thing to Abraham's son, Isaac. Notice in Genesis chapter 26, let's step back in the chapter there to verse 2. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I'll make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven, and I'll give to your descendants all these nations, and in your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. You are my people. God chose Abraham. God now chose Isaac. And then we jump forward two chapters to chapter 28. We see God then chooses Jacob. Notice in Genesis chapter 28, let's come down in our text there to verse 12. This is the dream that Jacob had. Uh, he dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east to the north and the south and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so, these, we see the beginning of God's people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, you know how the rest of the story goes. When Jacob was old, there was a great famine in the land, and God saved the family of Jacob through Joseph. Joseph took his whole family into the land of Egypt. And there, as God promised to Abraham, back in the book of Genesis there, <clears throat> pardon me, back in the book of Genesis, that his people would be a stranger in a foreign land for 400 years because the iniquities of the Amorites had not yet been fulfilled. 
but ultimately God would bring them back. That he would bring them out of the Egyptian captivity into this promised land. The problem, though, is that the first generation that Moses led out of the land of Egypt, they tested God. Although they were God's people, they challenged him. They tested him. They rejected the covenant that he made with them on Mount Sinai. We see this spelled out for us in the book of Hebrews. Turn forward in the book of Hebrews, if you would, to the chapter to the third chapter. And let's start reading in Hebrews 3, verse 7. The Hebrew writer, he's quoting a psalm, by the way, and your Bible probably has a footnote there placing that psalm to be somewhere right around, let's see if mine's got it here, verse 7. Psalms 95, 7 through 11. And here's what David says. In verse 7, he he attributes it to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and, I, and saw my works 40 years. This is David writing. This is what the writer of Hebrews is quoting from now. He's quoting David writing to the second generation. The generation that had come out, and we'll talk about this, are the generation that had been led into the land of Canaan. Years later, they now have kings, David serving as a king. He's admonishing them not to harden their hearts as in the rebellion. Do not test God or try God as their fathers tested God there in verse 9 and saw his works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So what happened to the first generation whom God led out of the Egyptian bondage? Well, they fell in the wilderness. Their bodies were scattered throughout all of the wilderness, the Bible tells us, with the exception of everyone who was under the age of 20 when they were led out. So now let's jump forward a little bit in time. They've roamed in the wilderness for 40 years. And the older generation has died off. Now Moses is preparing the people to finally enter into that land of Canaan. Observe with me what Moses says to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 15 through 19. And this is where the significance of the title of the lesson comes in to play. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, let's start our reading there in verse 15. He says, Look down from your holy habitation from heaven, And bless your people Israel in the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now verse 16 of chapter 26 of Deuteronomy. This day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments, and his judgments and that you will obey his voice. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments, and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made in praise and name and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. Did you see the term there, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people? King James Version renders it peculiar people. Peculiar here is not meaning odd, strange, funny looking, or anything like that. The idea of the Hebrew word translated as peculiar or special, it means possession or property, a valued property, peculiar treasure. One translation, a little bit more of a liberal translation, uses the term special treasure. And so the idea here is what God is telling Israel is that you will be my special people, my own possession. You will be that people that I treasure and I will take care of as long as you obey me, as long as you follow me, as long as you do that which I command. Imagine that. We knew that God favored Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and because of Abraham, God kept his promise to the descendants of Jacob there. But now in a one-on-one covenant with the people that God made with those people, he said, you are my own possession. You're my people. You are a people that I treasure. Now obey me. 
and follow me and keep my commands. But the problem, though, is that God found fault with these people. We said the first generation, many of them died out in the wilderness because of their sin. And David tried to warn this second generation not to harden their heart as in the day of rebellion. But even these people, the ones that David reigned over, the ones that Solomon reigned over, and then Rehoboam and all the subsequent kings leading all the way to Josiah, they, had, they were on a roller coaster ride of obedience and disobedience, obedience and disobedience. And finally he says to Josiah, I've had enough. Because of the sins of the people committed during the reign of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, they were going to go into captivity. It didn't matter that they were God's own special people. They were going away into captivity. But because of David, he would bring them back. He would not forget them. But even that was not enough for the people. You look at the history of the people after they were brought back out of the land of captivity. Laid the foundation of the temple and they went and were lazy for 16 years and neglected it. And time and time again, they went and took wives of foreign nations and that had to be dealt with. In the book of Malachi, they would bring uh, some sort of sacrifice to God that was blemished, that was ill and offer it to God. God would reject it. He said, go give it to your governor. They dealt treacherously with the wives of their youth. These were a stubborn people. Yes, they were God's own people. But yet time and time and time again, they disobeyed God. And so God finds fault with them. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews for just a moment, chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, notice with me beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> He says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Oftentimes people stop there. They say, well, really the problem was with the covenant that God made on Mount Sinai. It was full of faults. No, that's not what he's saying. Look at the next verse. Because finding fault with them. The covenant that God made with the children of Israel on Mount Sinai was sufficient for the cause with which it was established. But it was a conditional covenant. The covenant was, if you obey me, I'll give you all the land. I'll make you a great nation. If you do my commandments, you're going to have all the vegetation and everything that you need. If you do my will, you'll have reign over all your enemies. But he found fault with them. And so since they rejected the covenant that God made with them, then he rejected it. And the covenant could not deal with that, if, if you understand what I'm saying. The covenant was not intended to make amends or to, to account for a rebellious people. It was, if you mind me, I'll, be, I'll bless you, and if you don't, then I'll reject you. So that was in the way why he says, if the first covenant had been faultless then no place would have been fault, fault, sought for a second. It wasn't designed to deal with the fault that God would find with them because of their rebellion. So verse 8, because finding fault with him, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. He says, the covenant that I made with them, they rejected. So I disregarded them. You imagine, imagine someone tearing up a contract. Just shredding it. Well, God is rejecting. He's doing away this, with this covenant he had made with the people because they had rejected the covenant. They had to dis dis disobeyed the Lord. These people who had been a special people to God rejected God. So therefore, God rejected that covenant and as a result, made way for a new covenant. Notice, beginning in the same chapter of Hebrews 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant. And by the way, if you'll notice in your footnotes of this Bible, what we are reading this section is quoted directly from Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31. Jeremiah already warned that this was coming. Jeremiah, if you remember him, he prophesied during the time period of the southern nation of, Ju uh, of, of Judah. Just prior to their being carried off to the Babylonian captivity, he says, it's coming. I tell you, it's coming, and there's nothing you can do about it. He was a weeping prophet, Jeremiah. 
He didn't go to Babylonian captivity, though he was carried off into Egypt as a slave, as, as a captive. But he tried to warn them. He says, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my, my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his, his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that he says, A new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Jeremiah says, you know, because you rejected God, he's bringing about a new covenant. And you know what? During this day and age of the new covenant, they're going to mind God. They're going to listen to him. They're going to take his words and put it on their heart and put it in their mind. They're not going to be like the hypocritical people before who rejected his covenant. They're going to be the ones who he will have mercy on their sins. And no more will one go up to his neighbor saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know the Lord. A good explanation I heard one time of this is quite simple. Under the law of Moses, when you were born a Jew, you were born under responsibility to that law. But your parents had to teach you about God. They had to teach you about his word and who he was. But under the new covenant, every person that enters in under the new covenant does so because they already know about God. They already know about his word. You can have 15 children, and not one of your children will be a member of the body of Christ until they come to know about God and choose to believe and choose to obey. So he says a new covenant is going to come, and this new covenant, you'll notice in Hebrews chapter 9, took effect when one specific individual died. And that individual we'll call the testator. And if you don't know what a testator is, think about the word testator, think about the word testament. Testator is the one who, bring, who dies to bring in effect the testament writes the testament, prepares the testament, and then when that testator dies, the testament takes effect. Uh, long story short, you're, you're, you're 10 years old, and your parent says, guess what, son, I got some good news and some bad news. What's the good news? When I die, you're going to get $10 million. What's the bad news? I got a long way to go before I die. Okay? Your parents have set it up. You're going to get $10 million one day. And by the way, if you do, remember, I've been nice to you, if that does work out, by the way. But the point is, your parents says, here's the testament. One day when I die, this is what you get, but you don't get a dime of it before. Then one day the parents die, and the testament takes effect. Well, look here in verse 15, beginning in Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> For this reason, he is a mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Notice that. The testament has no force whatsoever as long as the testator lives. But once the one who writes the testament dies, then the testament takes force it takes effect. And because of this new covenant, because of the death of the testator and the empowering of the New Testament, there is now a special people. Someone says, I thought we started with the special people. We did. And those people rejected God. So who would be the special people now? A couple of passages here we look at to show this, beginning with Acts chapter 20, verse 28. We've already introduced the idea of the death of the testator, of Jesus Christ dying upon the cross of Calvary. Well, Paul, when he is having his discussion with the elders there from Ephesus, he says in Acts 20, verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he, that is Jesus Christ now, purchased with his own blood. When did Jesus Christ purchase the church with his own blood? When he died upon the cross of Calvary. When he, the testator, died. When, that, when his blood was shed upon the cross, the covenant took effect, 
And he purchased the church with his blood. And at the same moment, remember how God led his people, his special people out of Egypt? When Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, he redeemed his people. Notice with me in Titus chapter 2 for just a moment. Turn over our Bibles to the book of Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Observe with me if you would what Titus said, what Paul says to Titus. He says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Now we're not going to talk about the phrase special people just yet, but there's a glimpse into it. Focus, though, for the moment when he makes reference to us being redeemed, that he might redeem us from every lawless work. When he died upon the cross of Calvary, he shed his blood upon that cross of Calvary to redeem us from all our unlawless or our lawless deeds, to buy us back from our bondage into sin. That's why Ephesians 1.14 refers to us as a purchased possession. Let's turn there. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14. And I'll give you a little bit of insight into the sermon. It is actually this verse that began the idea for the lesson. It's always interesting to me to see how lessons develop and to see where they begin from. And here's what he says. And let's back up in the text here to verse 11 of Ephesians 1. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that he who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in him also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Notice what he refers to us as. He says that we are his purchased possession. We are the ones that have been bought by his blood being shed upon the cross of Calvary. And as a result, we belong to him. We are his special people. Turn back now to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Turn back to 1 Peter chapter 2. There in verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. He's talking about us now. He's talking about those who choose to believe. He's not talking about the lost in the world. He's talking about those people who learn about God, who see the evidence found within the word of God, and who come to belief and obedience these individuals, when you obey the gospel's call, these folks are added to the body of Christ. They become a part of this chosen generation, this royal priesthood, this holy nation. They become a part of his own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, did you notice what he said there? His own special people. The King James translation uses the term peculiar, and I've talked to you about this before. I remember hearing lessons off and on growing up through the years that Christians are strange people. We're peculiar. We look funny. We look different. It's okay for people to laugh at you. You're supposed to look different. That's not what that peculiar means there. Peculiar there means a possession of or peculiar to. The Greek word, very similar to the Hebrew word in definition I mentioned a while ago, means one's own possession. He says, the King James translation, we are a peculiar people. That is, we are peculiar to God. We belong to God. We are his own special people because he sent his son to die upon the cross of Calvary. Just as he chose Abraham and then led the descendants out of the Egyptian bondage, he's chosen us because of Abraham. And think about that for just a moment. While the physical nation of Israel were the offspring of Abraham by blood, we are, and this is what Romans 3 and 4 talks about, we are, in a manner of speaking, the offspring of Abraham by our faith in God. We are his spiritual offspring. And the, when he said to Abraham that through your seed all nations of the world would be blessed, we are the recipients of that because we are children of God. 
We are his own special people. And as a result, brethren, we've got to remain faithful. One thing I want to share with you, and then we're going to turn over to Hebrews chapter 4 and, and Hebrews 3 and look at kind of the, the rest of the story as the Hebrew writer develops. We don't believe in once saved, always saved. But what we do believe is the church that Christ built will never be defiled. The church that Christ built will never be with spot, will never be with blemish. And someone says, how can you say that every time you look around and you see an erring Christian who's a part of the body of Christ? Does he not bring a blemish upon the body of Christ? No. Someone says, how do you, how do you know that? What have we talked about before? What happens when we sin against God and we're unwilling to repent? We're cut off. We're out of fellowship. And first with God, out of fellowship with Christ, and we are out of fellowship with every single person who's in fellowship with God. Now, the local church is a little bit different. Okay? If you're living in sin, then you bring a direct effect and blight upon the local congregation. But as far as the body of Christ goes... It will never be like the children of Israel and rebel against God, for all who rebels will no longer be in that fellowship. Now, this brings us back to Hebrews 3. Because, beginning of verse 12, the Hebrew writer makes the application of, since that first generation rebelled against God, now what? Notice, beginning of verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 3, he says, Beware, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Remember, that's what David said. Today, if you will hear his voice. So the writer says, let us exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would not enter into his rest but those to, to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, he says, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Why not? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. What's the difference between the message that the Israelites heard and the message that we hear today? Well, with them, it was not mixed with faith. And with us, it must be mixed with faith if we are going to enter into that promised rest. For verse 3 says, For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place in the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today. After such a long time as it has been said, today you will hear his voice. If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore, or there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. The special people. The people who are of God's own possession, there still remains a rest. And the question for you and I, brethren, is quite simple. Will we enter that rest which remains? You're special. Every single person sitting here who has answered the gospel's call into salvation is special in that they are a people of God and they belong to God. The question for you and I is quite simple. Are we living as people of God? Are we taking the gospel message that we hear and are we mixing it with faith? Not simply at the point of obedience to the gospel's call into salvation, but every single day of our life. Are we mixing the gospel message with faith? That's what he talked about in Hebrews chapter 4. They did not mix the message they heard with faith. Therefore, they rebelled and they fell away. 
For us, it must be mixed with faith. Much beyond simply saying, I believe, and then being baptized into Christ. But every single day of our life, we must avoid a hardness of heart that leads to rebellion by mixing the word with faith and following the will of God and living as his special people. If you're not a Christian, you can become a special person of God. You can become one of God's peculiar people or people peculiar to God. But in order to do that, you must have faith. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then let's begin this evening by acting upon that belief. Let's not wait any longer. If you're willing to make the, the repentant change, turning away from sin to a life of faithful obedience unto God, turning away, repenting, and confessing before those who are present your belief, then based on what we see taught in the Scriptures and on the chart behind me, you will be saved. Being baptized into Christ, you rise up then to walk in a newness of life. There's a reason why Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And there is, there's a reason why Peter taught repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The reason is because of salvation. And the reason is so that you can be added to that body of Christ if you'll obey the gospel's call this evening. If you are a Christian and you've not been living faithfully, let's learn from the lesson of that former generation. Let's learn the lessons from those who once were the people of God but are no longer. And let's repent and turn back and live as God's own people should be living. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.